one dry lump. Everybody roger, go for the floor. Everybody in the tunnel, go for the floor. Roger, I have to be in order. We have all the records that are going to move your day. You're looking live at a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket on the launch pad at Space Launch Complex 41, where we are less than an hour away from the launch of Boeing's Starliner to the International Space Station. And welcome, everyone, to the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida. It's a humid day. It's a hot day, around 83 degrees, but it's a wonderful day because we're launching a rocket, and we've got coverage for you, live coverage of Boeing's Starliner Orbital Flight Test 2. I'm Daryl Nail with NASA. And I'm Dee Russell with Boeing Communications. Boeing crews worked throughout the day getting Starliner ready from Launch Complex 41, which is just a few miles away from us at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The instantaneous launch window is scheduled for 6.54 p.m. Eastern Time. This is an uncrewed mission that will test the Starliner spacecraft and Atlas V rocket beginning with launch, then going to docking and undocking, and then, of course, a return to Earth. This test flight will provide valuable data toward NASA certifying Starliner for regular flights with astronauts to and from the space station. Yeah, and the NASA astronauts are really looking forward to that. We're going to talk to them a little bit later on in the show. But let's take you back to yesterday morning. What a beautiful shot this is. Look at that. This is the rollout of the rocket to the pad. Two rail cars pulling the 3.5 million pound convoy to the mobile and the mobile launch platform along with the rocket and Starliner spacecraft from the vertical integration facility out to the launch pad. And what a journey. It takes about 20 minutes to travel that one third of a mile. The Atlas V rocket there, what a great shot. Standing 172 feet tall or about 52 meters and it weighs about 979,000 pounds or 444,000 kilograms fully fueled. That's a heavy rocket. Fast forward to today and you can see there from the live shot in preparation for launch, both stages of the Atlas V rocket were fueled up with propellant, and that happened just a few hours ago. And as you can see from some of our views provided from our launch cameras, it is a beautiful day out. We've got a low cloud deck in the area, some clouds that have developed. We'll talk to our weather officer about that in just a bit. And earlier today, another important pre-launch milestone was completed. Boeing's ground crews inside the White Room close the hatch to the Starliner. Although there's no crew flying on this second test flight, the Boeing closeout crew is working as if there is. Now let's check in with Launch Weather Officer Brian Sizik with the 45th Space Wing. Yeah, Brian, uh, we've got some clouds that moved in over the area. Earlier today, the, the clouds were not there. We had clear skies and it was looking good. But then we started to see some, some cloud cover and I can see in the background there that you're tracking that. Yes, Dale, you're right. And actually those high clouds that moved in, that's, you're seeing that filtered sunshine behind you right now. Those actually really help for our launch conditions today. And let me explain that a little bit. So we have this high upper level uh, cloud deck, uh, zero stratus clouds that are moving into the area. And that actually limited the amount of surface heating that we got throughout the day. And that's how the atmosphere heats up. It's almost like a boilerplate from the bottom. So the surface heats and that helps bubble up some of those showers and thunderstorms that we see so often here in Florida in the summertime. But as I mentioned, those clouds really helped to limit that heating. So we saw a lot less shower and thunderstorm coverage that than we would have otherwise seen throughout today. And if you look a little bit farther south, you can see where there was less of those upper level clouds. We actually had more of those showers and thunderstorms developing. So really overall, that is what's leading to some very good launch conditions today. Uh, my colleague Will Ulrich just briefed at the T minus one hour weather brief that the probability of go is now 90%. So let's look, take a look at that launch forecast, a 90% chance of go. The current weather status is go and a 90% chance that we remain go throughout uh, the count and into T zero. So overall conditions are looking really good. All the weather rules we look at are, are both for natural and trigger lighting and everything is looking good as we head closer to T zero. Guys? All right, that's a great update, Brian. We'll check in with you a little bit later for that L-30 
uh, briefing by Will Ulrich to the launch team. There's a distant shot of a launch pad. Slick 41, as they call it. We are L minus 48 minutes in counting. Just a few miles away from us is our team of launch commentators at United Launch Alliance's Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, or ASOC. They are listening in to the launch operations. We're talking about Dylan Rice, uh, launch director himself for United Launch Alliance. In fact, recently uh, oversaw the GOES-T launch. Well done. And Boeing's Lauren Seabrook, the newest member of Boeing's broadcast team. Welcome to you both. Hey, thank you so much, Daryl. Dylan and I are coming to you from the heart of ULA's operations, where we are really just tucked in the middle of everything going on. We are surrounded on all sides by the men and women, the engineers who are prepping the rocket. And actually, if we take a look behind us, you can see us up here kind of above all the action that's happening down below. And you can see what's happening on the sides here as well, just to give you a better perspective on where we're able to listen to the flight loops. So Dylan, why don't you Give us an update on how things are going with the rocket. Well, Lauren, Atlas V and Centaur are fueled and ready to go. The vehicle was rolled out to the pad yesterday where it was connected to the uh, propellant storage farms, air conditioning, all the other pad utilities. Uh, Daryl talked about that just a minute ago. The countdown started this morning about 7.30. We powered up the rocket, began our final checks of all of our avionics systems, and then started final preparations out at Launch Complex 41. All that work wrapped up around noon, and with Complex 41 and the launch vehicle ready, uh, we started cryogenic tanking just before 1 p.m. Cryogenic tanking takes under two hours to complete and went very, very smoothly today. Um, for now, the vehicle remains in stable topping and all of our pre-launch checks are basically complete. Um, the team is active, closing out the crew access tower as we speak. Once all that work is wrapped up, the team will clear the pad. This is the 93rd flight of the safe and reliable Atlas V launch vehicle, the second flight of the N-22 configuration, the 103rd launch from Slick 41, and ULA's 150th launch overall. This vehicle is equipped with a dual-engine Centaur, a configuration that is uniquely capable of providing all the performance required for Starliner's mission. So let's take a look at some video that we recorded just about an hour ago from our white room. This is when um, our pad team was wrapping up pre-launch procedures. Like I said, it wrapped up about an hour ago, but uh, some of the things you'll see on your screen have been happening uh, throughout the afternoon. They've been doing things like making sure the switches inside the spacecraft were all in the proper position. They removed ground support equipment that was no longer needed for Starliner, and they've ensured that all the air ducts were not blocked. They also armed the launch abort system switch inside the spacecraft. That's actually something the crew will do in the future, but because, of course, we have no crew on board today, the pad team took care of that for us. They also checked to see if the gravity indicator was secure. I can tell you, I can confirm, the gravity indicator is tethered to seat number two. And before the hatch closure, they purged the cabin to make sure that the humidity was at the right level. Once the hatch was closed, they checked for leaks by pressurizing it. And they basically do this by pushing air into the cabin and holding that pressure for about 10 minutes. It's kind of like inflating a balloon. If you think about if you were um, you know, pushing air into the balloon and holding it, if there were any holes in that balloon, you would notice it would start to leak and that would be very obvious. Well, the telemetry that feeds back to us can let us know if there are any leaks and um, that way, we know that we are safe to fly. And so once they checked the integrity of the hatch seal, they released that air and then they normalized the pressure. And everything so far has gone really smoothly. The entire pad team is actually called the blue team. It's made up of five people from Boeing and three people from ULA. And Dylan, they really work together, um, but they have a lot of different responsibilities. What are some of the things the ULA pad team members do? Well, the ULA team members are there to really manage the crew access tower system. So they're performing the safety checks of the tower and configuring the white room prior to um, prior to the team leaving the pad. Um, part of that configuration of the white room will be retracting the Starliner access plank and uh, raising the white room environmental seal for launch. Once all that work is done, the blue team will clear the pad and head for the fallback area for launch. And we also watched a really special moment of the team coming together right at the end of finishing their closeout procedures. They were um, arm in arm, kind of had their heads bowed, had a final moment there with the spacecraft before they left. So it was a really special moment and I'm sure um, it was special for them as well. So, Daryl and Dee, we'll go back to you. Thank you very much, Lauren. It'll be good to see that pad team helping the astronauts get aboard that spacecraft here soon. 
And now, after the Atlas V launches with Starliner aboard, there are several moments to look for. Take a look. Ascent begins at T minus zero, liftoff, the end of the countdown, and the beginning of the mission. Shortly afterwards, at T plus 12 seconds, the rocket rolls, lining up Starliner with its target orbit and putting the astronauts in a heads up position. Then, around T plus 40 seconds, max Q starts. That's also known as max aerodynamic pressure. This is a critical time when the atmospheric forces reach their heights. Next, at about plus 1 minute 35 seconds, the two solid rocket boosters run out of fuel and burn out, and about a minute later they separate from the booster. The Atlas booster engine continues to burn for almost two more minutes. Then at approximately plus 4.30, booster engine cutoff, or BECO. About five seconds later, the booster separates and so does the ascent cover on top of Starliner. At around 4 minutes 45 seconds, the Centaur upper stage ignites, continuing the push to orbital speeds. Then a little after 5 minutes, Starliner is free of the atmosphere and doesn't need additional aerodynamic support, and the aeroskirt is jettisoned. After a long 6 plus minute push from Centaur, main engine cutoff, or MECO, happens around 12 minutes after liftoff. Then, when Centaur successfully separates almost 15 minutes after launch, ULA's job is done. But Starliner is not quite in orbit yet. After a 16 minute coast, Starliner ignites four of its Orbital Maneuvering and Attitude Control or OMAC engines for the orbital insertion burn, and then 31 minutes after liftoff, the ascent profile is complete. Controlling Starliner's flight to the International Space Station are the teams at Mission Control in Houston. Let's check in with the launch commentators we will hear immediately after liftoff. NASA's Brandy Dean and Boeing's Josh Barrett are joining us from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Thanks so much, Daryl and Dee, and welcome to Mission Control Houston. Uh, have a good evening. Um, this, uh, Josh and I have been listening in um, on the team's preparations all day now. They are controlled today um, by a team who's been here since about 1 p.m. Central Time, listening in and uh, making sure everything is set for today's launch. They're led today by Flight Director Mike Lammers, uh, a longtime flight director. He's assisted by Flight Director Rick Hempling, who is helping him keep an eye on the weather and any constraints it may pose to us, particularly downrange at abort sites. And then as an added bonus, we also have Matthew Jominick sitting alongside the two as today's Capcom. You won't hear him speaking to the spacecraft today, but he's building up experience from Starliner's next flight when we'll have crew on board to talk to. And that's right. Now, uh, as some of you have been following this mission are aware that Rosie the Rocketeer, our anthropometric test device, is sitting in the commander's seat right now in Starliner. Now, she won't be doing any piloting of her own. She'll be getting a lot of help from Starliner's automated flight software and then hopefully some minimal help from the team here in this control room on the ground if all is going well, but the team has been commanding the vehicle since about L minus three hours, so just over two hours ago they've really taken command of the vehicle. Here in the control room behind us we've got uh, console operators monitoring all their systems. Immediately behind us we've got our GNC and propulsion subsystem operators. Uh, the team really seems to be in good spirits. It's been a relatively clean countdown and uh, so far, it's, it's been pretty quiet, and we're really looking forward to launch. Yeah, everything looking good as we count down to today's 5.54 p.m. Central launch time, 6.54 Eastern. Um, and that is uh, just about 39 minutes away now. But, of course, Starliner will be docking at the International Space Station. So we want to make sure that the space station is ready to host us. That means that just down the hall, we've got the International Space Station flight control team watching over their systems and verifying that they're ready. We're going to toss it down there now to Gary Jordan, who's been watching over with them. 
Hey, thank you, Brandy and Josh. Yes, I'm right down the hall here in Mission Control, Houston. Behind me, the flight controllers are looking after the orbiting laboratory. That's the destination of the Boeing Starliner, the International Space Station. Teams here are led by Flight Director Anthony Varia. Right now, they're checking out the station systems to get ready for a go for launch and making sure that the station itself is ready to receive Starliner. We'll be watching today's launch closely in this room, but really we'll kick into gear tomorrow when we set up for joint operations with the teams down the hall where Brandy and Josh are controlling the Boeing Starliner. Shortly after launch and throughout tonight, Starliner will execute a series of burns to gradually raise its orbit and catch up with the orbiting lab. We'll also see a series of demonstrations to test Starliner systems and capabilities all along the way until docking, about 24 hours after launch. In the meantime, the Expedition 67 crew is in a sleep period, getting some rest before supporting a docking late at night Greenwich Mean Time tomorrow. But we did hear that the crew uh, requested to watch the launch through the broadcast. So everybody say hi to the crew. From left to right, we have NASA astronaut Bob Hines, European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Christopheretti of Roscosmos. We have Denis Matveyev, uh, Oleg Artemyev, and Sergei Korsakov. And rounding out the crew with NASA astronauts Jessica Watkins and Chell Lindgren. Uh, Lindgren and Heinz will be monitoring Starliner's approach and docking tomorrow. After tomorrow's docking, the crew will open up the hatches the following day and formally welcome the Starliner to the station. So again, the International Space Station flight control teams are getting ready to give their go for launch. In the meantime, let's get back to the action with Dee and Megan over at the Kennedy Space Center. Here to talk about the importance of this day is Kennedy Space Center Director Janet Petro, and she's with NASA's Megan Cruz. Dee, thank you so much, and yes, this is Janet Petro. Janet, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Megan. Well, today's flight test is about certifying Boeing's Starliner capsule. Can you talk to us about what that means? Sure, that's right, Megan. Um, this orbital test flight is going to be launching, of course, uh, from here. It's going to be going docking with the International Space Station, then it's going to be undocking, and then it's going to be landing in the Western Hemisphere. And this is an uncrewed test flight. Um, and then this will allow us to be able to certify that vehicle so that we will then be able to put our crew on it for another test flight, and then that will lead to services with the um, Boeing Starliner where we can purchase them. Right. So then once it's certified, then that means we have a second provider. How will that help NASA's commercial crew program grow? So when we started out this program, you know, we always wanted to have more than one provider. So having a second uh, provider that we can purchase a commercial service from to transport our astronauts to and from the International Space Station gives us a, a reliability, a redundancy that we really need and we really want uh, within our uh, commercial crew program. And that allows us to do even more research on the International Space Station, allow us to do the technology development that we're going to need as we continue our exploration mission further out into deep space, back to the moon, and then on to Mars. So it sounds like a second provider is going to mean more launches from here on the Space Coast. You know, how has Kennedy Space Center been handling this ever-growing role as a multi-user spaceport? So it's interesting. I, I found a pamphlet um, in, in my dad's uh, uh, belongings that showed that as early as in 1970s, Kennedy was known as America's spaceport. And as you know, about 10 years ago, following the um, retirement of the space shuttle, we embarked on a transformation to a multi-user spaceport. And what you see out here today is a result of that um, transformation. And so you're absolutely right. We have an awful lot of uh, launches uh, from here. We are a very, very busy spaceport, and we're very, very proud of it. We have over 250 agreements, um, wow. close to 100, uh, uh, or 250 partnerships and 100 separate agreements. Agreements uh, out here today. And another just interesting fact one of the first assets or facilities that we didn't need after the space shuttle program that we entered a partnership in is the very one that the Starliner was being built in today. So oh, the wow. C 3 PF that the uh, Starliner was manufactured and tested in um, today that we're going to launch on this test flight um, started uh, more than 10 years ago with that, that used to be the Orbiter Processing Facility, or OPF-3 as we knew it. So. Yeah, I love when things come full circle. Thank it, you so it, much, Janet. You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you, Megan. Back to you guys. All right, thank you, Meg Megan and Janet. Great history there on the Boeing facility here at Kennedy. Time now to find out how the countdown to the launch of NASA and Boeing's Orbital Flight Test 2 is going. We're at L minus 34 minutes and counting. So let's get back to the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center with Lauren and Dylan. 
Daryl, from where I'm standing right here, I'm able to actually turn around and see NASA astronaut Sunny Williams, and she's on console working with her colleagues and following along with this countdown. Of course, she's here because we do not have any crew on board today. Um, we are taking a rather heavy load of cargo up with us, about 800 pounds up to the ISS. Rosie the Rocketeer is back, as you heard Josh mention earlier. Of course, she sort of stole the show last time, but What's really amazing is we were able to gain so much information from the sensors that were on her last time that now we've moved those sensors to other parts of the spacecraft and to the other seats in the spacecraft. That way we have a better idea of how other passengers will ride on Starliner. Now, having her in the commander's seat also helps maintain the center of gravity during the mission. And you can see she's wearing the OFT2 mission patch on the right side of her chest. And of course, the classic red bandana with white polka dots. Hers was actually autographed by one of the original Rosie the Riveters, Mae Cryer. She wrote to her, to the moon and the stars. Our Rosie named that after that Rosie, of course, and they are both they both embody inspiration, strength, hope, and determination. A famous World War II icon and Boeing factory worker who helped build planes at just 17 years old, Rosie the Riveter recruited scores of women to enter the workforce in record numbers. Today, Boeing continues its rich history of recruiting, supporting, and developing women. I can personally attest to that. And as of last year, no, women made up more than 24% of Boeing's workforce. Now, Let's talk about some of the other cargo going up. They will also be taking NASA cargo with them, uh, food and crew going up for the current expedition crew. And then we will be bringing back about 600 pounds of NASA cargo from the ISS. We will also be taking some commemorative items for many organizations that play a role in Starliner's development, including several American flags, mission patches, and other unique items that will make the trip to orbit. And then later we'll be able to give those back to 14 historically black colleges and universities throughout the U.S. So pretty cool for someone to have something tangible to be able to say this was once in space. Um, our teams are activating the service module propulsion system right now for launch, sort of like priming your engine, making sure things are ready to go for both nominal and abort situations. Dylan, how are things going with the rocket? Well, things are going great with the rocket, Lauren. Um, we remain in the final built-in hold as we continue to prepare for liftoff. There are a few activities still ahead of us today. Uh, the blue team is now clearing the uh, clearing the tower and clearing the pad, and final preparations for launch are underway as we prepare the vehicle's propulsion and hydraulic systems for flight. The avionics team will be uh, taking upper-level wind data and loading that into our flight computer. That helps Atlas, Centaur, and Starliner kind of steer its way through the, the winds as we uh, move through the atmosphere. Um, also, we'll, we'll hear very shortly comm checks between the uh, Launch Control Center, Mission Control in Houston, uh, the BMCC at Kennedy Space Center, um, and then for crewed missions, the astronauts will, prepare, will participate in that comm check as well. Uh, once all that work is done, the crew access arm will be retracted, and then the uh, team will start the final polling for launch. And as you mentioned, there are a lot of things that our crews throughout both ULA and Boeing are doing today as sort of practice for crewed launch. They don't necessarily have to do it today, but it's a good time to practice for the next flight. So, Daryl and Dee, back over to you. All right, we'll check back in with you both in just a little bit. Today is Boeing's third test of the Starliner capsule. In November of 2019, Boeing successfully completed a pad abort test, which demonstrated the spacecraft's ability to keep astronauts safe in the unlikely event of an emergency on the pad or during flight. A month later, Starliner launched on the first orbital flight test, or OFT. The spacecraft got into orbit and safely returned from space, but did not get into the proper orbit to rendezvous with the space station, and that leads us to today, with OFT2. And Starliner's return to the launch pad comes after months of diligent testing and analysis work by the Boeing team. This became necessary when propulsion system valves did not open as designed during pre-launch system checks last year. Here's a closer look at our journey in preparation for today's flight. Three, two, one, and lift off the rise of Starliner and a new era in human spaceflight. We're right there again, ready to launch and excited for it.
I walk around and see everybody, they, they have their A game on. It's taken a village, really, to get to where we are. On our day of launch, for the first attempt of OFT2, we were going through our nominal day of launch procedures, um, our nominal checkouts, and we found that um, during our countdown to launch, we had valves that were not functioning properly. Last year's uh, launch attempt was scrubbed because we could not satisfy some launch commit criteria that were put in place in order for us to have a safe mission. The team took a really hard look at the data and said, you know, we're not comfortable with flying. We have to fail to succeed. Um, failure is just something that, um, you know, it, it's going to happen. But as long as you learn. And that's the reason you want to be an engineer. That's the reason you want to be a technician is to solve, solve those problems as they come up. We carefully took a step back. We troubleshot the problem. And we got to an understanding of what the failure was. We put mitigation in place. And we've proven that that mitigation works. And we've tested the valve several times uh, in preparation for this flight. So for this flight, we are flying with a brand new service module. We are flying with entirely new valves. And we are also flying with an integrated uh, direct purge system, which is going to keep our valves nice and dry and uh, prevent that corrosion from forming. So we ended up with a higher quality product in the end, which is fantastic because we've learned a lot from it. We really took our time to get it right because ultimately our goal is to fly astronauts safely to and from the International Space Station and safety is paramount. People that are very passionate about the work that they do, uh, they understand uh, the importance of every little step that they take and, and it contributes to making this vehicle the safest and of the highest quality. It's huge really to have a second crew transportation system. Um, we really want that, that's the goal of the commercial crew program. Every decision that we, that we make, we, we definitely have the astronauts' uh, safety in mind. It's not only the astronauts that are flying it, but it's the people working around the spacecraft. Our goal is to keep everyone safe. Knowing, again, that our friends are going up there and, and they're going to take this awesome ride to space and come back home and we're going to be able to deliver them back to their families, you know, safe and sound. It's pretty special. It really is. I am very emotional about it, yes, because this has just been a passion of mine for a long time. First launch proved that we could meet two of the objectives. One was getting successfully into orbit and two was landing the vehicle safely. This mission is all about what everything that happens in between. We're, we're going to launch, it's going to go great, we're going to come back home, and then we're on to the next one. Go Boeing. That is my last thought. It, it's, it's two words, just go Boeing. Here's a live look inside the Boeing Mission Control Center, where the launch team is working and monitoring pre-launch operations along with NASA astronauts. Yeah, that's right, Dee. There's two NASA astronauts on console with this launch team today. They are Commander Barry Butch Wilmore and Mission Specialist Mike Fink. And there they are. They're joining us live from a room immediately next door to the BMCC because we didn't want to pull them too far away from their consoles. Hey, guys, thank you both for taking the time. Butch and Mike, uh, you guys were some of the last people to see and look inside that spacecraft today. Mike, we have a shot of you actually uh, doing some work. Tell us a little bit about what you did and what you saw and how you're feeling. Yes, uh, Starliner looks great. Uh, myself and uh, our uh, other astronaut, uh, Sonny Williams, who uh, along with the Boeing team, uh, who stayed up late last night getting the capsule ready. Uh, we performed comm checks back and forth uh, to the Mission Control Center in Houston, uh, to the uh, Boeing Mission Control Center here in uh, Florida at KSC. Um, we did it all through the TDRIS, which is a, um, a tr uh, tracking and data relay satellite that we use uh, for uh, communication. So everything looked uh, really good. Uh, we set up the switches. Rosie doesn't move so much, so we set them up for her, and uh, we uh, made sure the cockpit was ready for launch. Yeah, and I didn't go because Rosie took my spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is anthropomorphic, not animatronic, right? <laughs> so We did give her a high five on the way out. You did? Uh, we, oh, wish her, we, we wish her all the best. <laughs> She's going to get some great data for us, too, especially for the launch loads and the landing loads. Uh, so that we know that it's uh, going to be great for humans to go fly. We have a question for Mike Fink now. Why does NASA need two commercial crew providers? 
Well, we can't keep all of our eggs in one basket. And uh, I think some of the words that we've been uh, saying in the past couple of days is dissimilar redundancy. In other words, we have another way to go up uh, besides, the, besides the SpaceX and the Crew Dragon, and it's dissimilar. So we're not using the same rocket or the same, uh, the same capsule. So if there's something wrong with one, we can still have a chance uh, to continue our continuous human uh, presence aboard the International Space Station. And it allows uh, NASA to, to not worry about the launches and landings for space station flights so we can focus on going to the moon and beyond. Butch, how does an uncrewed uh, test flight, which is autopilot, as you know, prepare you for your flight test where you're going to be doing some of the manual flying of Starliner? Yeah, I, I tell you, uh, it is uncrewed, and we are very jealous about that uh, <laughs> because this is human space flight after all, right? But this is a normal progression. This is, this is a test evolution, right? This is experimental developmental space flight test. And as you go through, we're testing on the ground, as you know, all the different various systems. We're in the simulator testing uh, software, hardware. And of course, this is, like I said, the normal progression. So we'll go through the processes to go all the way to launch, uh, rendezvous and dock, undock, fly around, return to Earth, and enter descent and landing and all of that. And we learn an immense amount through all of those processes that are beneficial as we go forward because, like you said, we do have also flight test objectives to certify the spacecraft that we'll be doing when we have the crewed mission, which will be next, you know, hopefully six months or uh, six months or so. So uh, we'll get there eventually, but we have to get this one done first to make sure that we are in line for, the, for that, that crewed mission. Mike, how does a mission to low Earth orbit help with missions to deep space? Yes, so uh, I was really lucky. Uh, we... Uh, uh, when I came here in 1996, we didn't have a space station yet. And with the International Space Station, we've learned how to live uh, in orbit. We've been able to um, work on some technologies such as our life support systems and other things and how to keep humans in, living in space for long periods of time. And then that will help us when we go to the moon and Mars and other places because we know how to live in space, not just visit like we, uh, we did in the early off. parts of the program. So it's a natural progression. All right, very good. And you know what? You guys were both out there at the pad, and we have proof of it. We're going to throw up a picture. There you guys are in front of the rocket. That's a nice shot. I think, yeah. Butch, you're a little taller. Yeah, a little taller. <laughs> hey, we want to thank you both for being with us. Really appreciate your time. We'll let you get back on console. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Go Starliner. All right, the 45th Space Wing just wrapped up a weather briefing with the launch team. Let's bring back in Weather Officer Brian Sizik to talk about what was discussed. Brian, uh, Will Ulrich gave that briefing, your fellow launch weather officer. Uh, any updates there? Yes, you did. Weather continues to look really good. As you mentioned, we just heard that brief from my colleague Will Ulrich, the lead launch weather officer on this mission, and weather continu continues to look very favorable as we head closer and closer to T0. So here's a little bit of a different look. Earlier we looked at satellite. Now let's take a live look at the radar. There's Complex 41 and a 10 nautical mile ring around the pad that we're concerned about in terms of weather. And the one feature that you'll notice here, this squiggly line, that's actually the leading edge of the sea breeze pushing in. And that can often be a trigger for showers and thunderstorms in the summertime and, and late spring as we're in right now. But notice really nothing going on across central Florida. And that's all thanks to those high upper level cirrus clouds really limiting the stability in the atmosphere. So we remain go for weather and a 90% probability of remaining go as we head into T0. Guys, back to you. Fantastic update. Thank you very much. Brian Sizik, launch weather officer with the 45th Space Wing. Now we're getting down to money time. I know. The launch conductor is also talking to his team, and we want to carry that moment live for you. Bravo, bravo. So, so let's go back over to Lauren and Dylan at the Space Atlas Space Flight Operations Center. Yeah, Dee, we are waiting to hear the spacecraft poll as well as the launch vehicle poll, which will be coming up here shortly. But in the meantime, I want to tell you about some of the preps that have been going on um, with our team over the last month. Our team has been cycling through Starliner's isolation valves every few days since it was fueled up about 20 days ago. And that has continued while the spacecraft has been out at the launch complex. Just a few hours ago, they also cycled through one last time, meaning they made sure each valve opened and closed with no problem. And everything went well, and we are ready to fly. And um, they also just a few minutes ago were able to open the valves, and those will remain open through launch. So we are good to go on all 
all of that. Our teams have worked as well on the mission elapsed timer since OFT1 to ensure that it operates nominally today and during future flights. And before we came on the air, the spacecraft and launch vehicle were synchronized with the mission elapsed time at L minus three hours. That will be done again during the terminal count and the flight director will verify it once we get into ascent. Now again, in just a few minutes, we are expecting the Starliner readiness poll. Let's take a live look now inside the Boeing oh, Mission Control players. Center. That is where that poll will come Step from. 90. And All it is a very short poll. We will hear Roger. the spacecraft launch conductor, Lewis Atchison, poll All people inside that room in charge of the propulsion system and power and many other subsystems. We will hear three calls. One of those calls will come from the mission support room manager or the MSR. And that's because after launch, this room actually turns into mission support as things shift over to Houston. So they are there to have their back of um, their colleagues over in Houston. We will also hear from the spacecraft test conductor during that poll who monitors our power systems. And the third call will come from the flight director over in mission control. So we are expecting that poll to happen here pretty soon. And I think we will um, stay quiet for just a moment and listen in for that poll. Flight STC MSR manager, this is Slick on Launch Ops. This time we'll conduct our CST-100 poll for terminal count. Report readiness to support terminal count when prompted. MSR manager. MSR is ready. STC. ECT is ready. Flight. Flight is go. CST-100 is proceeding with final configuration for launch. All operators monitor LCCs and report any LCC violations to your operations leads. SMD, slick, launch ops. SMD. CST-100 is ready for terminal count. The management poll for launch will be conducted on ULA Channel 3 at L minus 8 minutes. SMD copies. All right, sounds good. We are good for that. So Dylan, can you talk to us a little bit more about the go for launch poll that we're waiting to hear now? Sure, Lauren. So those once that polling is done, the uh, the next big poll is going to be coming up at uh, L minus eight minutes is the mission management team poll. That's going to be conducted right next door to us in the mission director center. And uh, that will be uh, ULA launch director uh, Lou Mangieri, who's going to collect those from the spacecraft mission director and ULA director of engineering in preparation for pro providing the uh, final permission to launch to Chief Launch Conductor Doug Lebo at the end of our terminal count status check. All right, Dylan, well, we are just about 17 minutes away from launch. We will now toss it over to our colleagues, Josh and Brandy in Houston. Thanks, Lauren. It's, I feel like we've said the word pull a whole lot just now because it is this point in the countdown when a whole lot of pulls happen actually Flight Director Mike Lammers pulled his team right before he reported into our spacecraft launch conductor, Lewis Atchison, back in the BMCC. Um, I can't help but smiling because we're all go right now. It is very quiet here in Mission Control. Uh, from here on out, uh, console operators will be monitoring what's known as their launch commit criteria, or LCCs, and their flight rules. Now, those are uh, very long, very involved documents that basically just list the parameters that the spacecraft and the rocket have to be in to go to flight. That is uh, including both redundant and primary systems. We went everything on Starliner working before we go fly today. And right now, everything seems to be working. So we're, we're in a good countdown right now. That's right. There are just a few more milestones to get through before launch. One coming up in the next minute or so is uh, the switching of Starliner from external to internal power. At that point, the spacecraft will be on battery power from there on out. But for the most part, the team here is just watching, waiting, and standing ready for a launch. Now 15 minutes away. We'll send you back to Florida for now, but we will be back with you starting at liftoff, so, so stay tuned. Daryl? All right, Brandy and Josh, thank you, and we'll see you then. NASA is relying on Boeing and several other providers to help sustain our permanent presence in space. Joining us now with more on that is NASA's Deputy Administrator and Space Shuttle Astronaut, Pam Melroy. She's with me. Yeah, Daryl, of course, Pam Melroy, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm excited to be here. This is a great day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, you flew on three shuttle missions. I'm telling you like you don't know. <laughs> All to build the International right. Station, Space Station. So with that in mind, how does it feel to be here today as NASA works to certify a second provider, meaning more trips, hopefully, to the International Space Station? Oh, this is a great moment. You know, when we built the space station, we were really focused on all the amazing science that we could do and the innovation. 
And so now having another way to get there just gives us more resilience. It allows us to do even more science. And I think as a former shuttle astronaut, at a time when there were only two human spacecraft that were available in the entire world, yeah. and now we have more, and that means more people can go to space. And uh, the innovation that happens at the space station is just so exciting to think about. Yeah, I love how you light up when you talk yeah. about this, because uh, t tell me, I mean, it's so important to sustain this permanent presence in space, right? It's incredibly important. Uh, we hope to go out into the solar system with humans to do science and to explore. And those are really long trips. So we really need to understand how to live and operate in space. The International Space Station is providing critical technologies that we are testing to go on, onto the moon and out to Mars and even beyond. Right. But in addition to that, what we've really found is that having a, a lab allows us to have more innovation. Yeah. So the shuttle only flew five, six, seven times a year for about 10 days to two weeks at a time. Now we have more payloads, more experiments. We have commercial research going on on the station. So that permanent presence allows us to make so much more progress. Yeah. So as a former astronaut, as a former test pilot before that, you know, can you give us some insight into how our NASA astronauts must be feeling today as they watch this uncrewed test flight? Well, for test pilots, um, uh, in God we trust, everyone else brings data. <laughs> so uh, what, what you see as a test pilot is uh, the fascination with, okay, how's everything going to work? What, what we have learned through uh, many years in the aviation side is that the engineers do their best, uh, but there's always things that happen that you don't expect. And so uh, really that's what the crew is looking for. They're looking for what worked, uh, what we need to continue to work on. That is actually the meaning of a test flight. Uh, so it's as a tester, it's actually a great moment to see it come together. Yeah, to get that opportunity. Yes. Perfect. Jana, thank you so much. Oh, Jana, Pam, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. <laughs> thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> Back to you guys. All right. Thank you very much. And we are L minus 12 and a half minutes and counting until liftoff. And you can see behind us the rockets on the pad. Atlas V Starliner is ready to go. We just heard that uh, the launch team saying it's a great day, a beautiful day to go fly Starliner. We are anticipating it. It is a, a lot day. of anticipation out here for this one. And ULA and Boeing are finishing up their preparations for launch. And so um, we want to give you one other note. Once Starliner launches, the ISS, its destination, will be flying 257 statute miles over the North Atlantic. Now let's head to the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center where Lauren and Dylan will tell us what those teams are doing. And then they will count us down to liftoff. Hey D, Starliner is just about ready to switch over to internal power. So we're waiting for that. And then also we are going to start seeing that crew access arm start to retract back and we will see it move quite slowly today. But Dylan, if it needed to in case of an emergency, it could really get out of there pretty quickly. Yeah, that's right, Lauren. And I just heard the uh, command get given to, uh, to start the crew access arm retraction, but that crew access arm rotates 120 degrees back to the crew access tower. It takes uh, just under two minutes to do, but it can, re it can be redeployed in about 15 seconds in the event of an emergency. With no crew aboard, we won't see anything like that today. All right, and we do want to let you know that after liftoff, Dylan will do the flight dynamics from here in the ASOC. Then Brandy and Josh will continue their commentary from Houston through ascent, spacecraft separation, and the orbital insertion burn. We also want to let you know today that we are updating our internal camera system on Starliner to have more live views inside in the future. But for today, we'll be able to watch cameras on the rocket. We will also have live telemetry feeding back that will provide us with a real-time look at a spacecraft model that we will be able to take a look at and know exactly what's happening with the spacecraft when video is not possible as it moves through the dynamic phases of flight. So we are coming up on L minus 10, getting very close here, and we are now waiting um, to hear the next call, which will be to verify that Starliner is on internal power. And we were going to um, listen into the loops for just a few seconds. L minus 10 minutes. Oh, I love that you explained that. L minus 10 Flight verify CST 100 on internal power. And Starliner Verified. is now on internal power. Oh, 
Today is an instantaneous launch window. You may be sometimes used to seeing that the time of launch can uh, shift a bit, but not for us today. We have um, a launch window that we have to go right on the dot, and that is because we wait to launch till the orbital path for the ISS aligns up with the Space Coast and with Central Florida. And then once we get up into orbit, Starliner essentially plays a game of catch up with the space station. It just works to um, catch right up to it and eventually reaches the same speed of more than 17,500 miles an hour. So, Lauren, we should be hearing in just a minute that uh, confirmation that the crew access arm is stowed and latched for launch. Everything is looking good, and the silence is golden at the moment. Yeah, we're about uh, 38 seconds now away from the uh, mission management pole that I spoke about earlier, L and uh, eight, that, that will lead up to seconds. the uh, terminal count status check coming up here at all minus seven. Flight minutes. verify ordinance configured for launch. Verified. And Starliner's ordinance is configured for launch now. That basically means that the devices that initiate our separation events are ready to support both nominal and contingency operations that happen or could happen during the ascent profile. Now minus eight minutes. We are eight minutes to launch. All right, and we did hear on one of the other loops that that uh, mission manager... LC, arm was... control. Go ahead. First step, 260. Crew access arm stowed for launch. Roger. And that call indicating that the crew access arm is now stowed and latched LC, on. switch to ready position. All steps are complete prior to the status check. So we're going to listen in now to Chief Launch Conductor Doug Lebo, poll his team. Coming up in 10 seconds. Now minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulic. Go. Pneumatic. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatic. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. As gas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFDS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Op support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilical. Go. Arm control. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Flight director. Houston flight is go. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC verified T0 is set for 22 colon 54 colon 47 Zulu. Verified. And Lauren, you heard it there. It goes all the way across the board. Uh, the clocks are set, and we are ready to pick up the count on time for a uh, for a liftoff here in just under six minutes. And Lauren, I'll just tell you that we have executed this status check many times. Uh, we've pulled for launches to the sun, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, Pluto, all manners of Earth orbits. Every mission and every countdown is unique and exciting, but uh, the ULA team is absolutely thrilled to put Mighty Atlas back in service of human spaceflight. And I know that that's something the astronauts have told me, that they uh, feel so confident about eventually riding on top of an Atlas V rocket because it's been all over uh, the solar system. It's pretty amazing. It's an amazing machine. We should be hearing Starliner configured for terminal count here in just a few seconds. L minus five minutes. LC flight, Starliner configured for terminal count. Roger. There you go. Starliner is now configured for terminal count. L minus four minutes and 45 seconds. 
All steps are complete prior to terminal count. And Lauren, with that call, that uh, all of the work is now complete and the computers are going to take over the automated countdown at T minus four minutes coming up in here in uh, just about 30 seconds. L minus four minutes and 30 seconds. Just a beautiful shot there. By mark, the time will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. Three fifty five. Ground pyro is enabled. Ground system ordinance has been enabled. Atlas Hydraulics at flight pressure. Atlas's hydraulic steering system has been pressurized for flight. Three minutes. Three, three minutes to launch. Securing LO2 topping. Pressurizing Atlas tanks. Topping of liquid oxygen in the Atlas has now completed, and Atlas propellant tanks are pressurized internal. for flight. Two minutes. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Bot sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LH2. Centaur hydrogen and oxygen are now at flight level and topping is being terminated. 140. Launch enabled. 137. FTSR. One twenty. OC is armed. SCS count started. EDS ascent. EDS armed and ready means the emergency detection system is now armed. One and minute. that basically just means Rock that if it detects static. something, it will change the launch abort system on Starliner and fire Three automatically. Four. The PLP spacecraft started. would push itself far up and away from the rocket. We're talking a mile up and a mile out in just a matter of seconds. We certainly don't expect to see that today. 40. Atlas at flight press. Thirty. Thirty seconds. Centaur at flight press. Vehicles now pressurized for flight. Twenty-five. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Starliner. All systems are go for liftoff. Go Starliner. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Starliner is headed back to space on the shoulders of Atlas powered by a workforce dedicated to its success.
get confirmation of a good MET EPIC timer on Starliner. Executed its role program. Already ready is now throttling down to maintain the crew and heads up position to get crew on board today. This is the first plan throttle down for Atlas in preparation for Max Q. Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure limit. Right now, atmospheric forces are the highest Starliner Atlas will face during the uphill climb. Mach 1, Atlas 5 and Starliner are now supersonic. Fecal now throttling up. Up, ne up next in about 20 seconds, Starliner's two solid rocket boosters will run out of fuel and burn out. And we have burnout on both SRBs. Good crew module forward link connection. Already ready is throttling back up to full thrust. Now that we pass the solid rocket booster burnout, you'll soon see those two solid rocket boosters separate from the vehicle. Atlas V now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 2,800 pounds per second. And we have indication of SRB jettison. Atlas continues to ascend using solely the RD-180 engine. That's about 850,000 pounds of, of thrust at sea level. Already ready is throttling down slightly as expected. Engine response looks good. Teams here on the ground confirming Starliner has a good trajectory. We're now two minutes and 55 seconds into today's flight. Flying at an altitude of 56 kilometers. Our next throttle down will be to control acceleration forces, uh, limit forces on the crew to bel below 4 Gs. That is safe for an extended period of time. One minute remaining in this burn. One minute to Biko. Already when he's now throttling to maintain 3.5 G acceleration on the vehicle. Starliner flying off the uh, east coast at this point at an uh, altitude of 80 kilometers now, moving at a rate of 1,187 miles per hour. It's just passing North Carolina and Virginia off the northeastern seaboard. For those of you watching along the coastline, you might be able to see this launch. We have Pico booster engine cutoff. We have successful sta success staging. Pre-start on the RL tens. We have ignition on both RL tens. Centaur is now gone to closed loop steering. Just passed through several milestones. Teams here on the teams here on the ground reporting that all are looking good. Ascent cover jettison there that provided that air structure jettison. to the top of Starliner, protected the docking equipment during ascent. Mm -hmm. 
And now that Starliner and Centaur are free of the atmosphere, well into the vacuum of space, that aeroskirt skirt has been jettisoned. Now six minutes into today's launch, Starliner continuing to accelerate up the North American coast. Everything going smoothly so far. Starliner and Centaur have been ticking through their asset milestones right on track, including the booster stage separation, Centaur ignition, and aeroskirt jettison. A number of status calls we'll be listening for in the next several minutes, but if all continues to go well, the next major milestone to watch out for is the main engine cutoff when Starliner will be officially in space. We heard a report from uh, ULA's team. We had a, a little bit of an overperformance on the booster, but the, that's a good Five thing. Centaur is more than capable of adjusting on the fly in its closed loop performance. Centaur pressures are stable. Centaur looks good. Flight control teams are also monitoring the performance of the sublimator on Starliner right now. The sublimator is what is used to control cabin temperatures going up to space and coming home. Normally we use uh, the radiators on the service module, but uh, those are not powered up until we get into orbit. We heard confirmation that St. John's abort zone is open. We pre-select these uh, splashdown zones in the case of any needed aborts. Um, the first one would be the Saint off the coast of St. John's, Nova Scotia. We just heard the flight dynamics officer report everything is pretty good. Flight controllers here in Mission Control confirming that our main engine, main engine cutoff time is looking stable. It is going to be 11 minutes and 50 seconds into the flight. We are now 8 minutes and 50 seconds in, so that's uh, still about 3 minutes to go until we hit that milestone. Now one of the next calls that we will hear is that the Shannon abort zone will be open. Now you can see on your screens that Starliner is making Two its way up the North one. American coast, just starting to go into the Atlantic Ocean, Northern Atlantic Ocean. We pre-plan our flight trajectories so uh, we would not aboard a crew into the middle of the ocean. They'd be near enough to land for quick and speedy recovery. So we're still in that St. John's abort zone. Expect to hear that Shannon open call coming. And we just heard that call. Shannon now open. Sister Langer 
could potentially make that abort landing off the coast of Ireland now if needed, but so far no reason to think it will be. Starliner currently 153 kilometers above uh, the Pacific Ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and that's about 95 miles. Sixty seconds to Miko. We are eleven minutes into today's flight. Centaur and Starliner are passing Mach twenty three, Mach twenty three point three and counting. Altitude of just under one hundred and fifty kilometers. Miko's main engine cutoff when both of, dual, of the dual engine Centaur RL 10s are scheduled to shut down. That again is coming up at 11 minutes and 50 seconds. About five seconds away now. And we have Miko 1. Center engines have cut off. RCS is now at 100% Main engine cut off, so. right on time. Starliner is in space, but not done with the ascent milestones. Hearing in the room that it was a good main engine cut off. The next milestone that we'll be looking for is launch vehicle separation, when Starliner will separate from Centaur booster and fly on its own. Even after that happens, we'll have about 15 minutes until our final major milestone in today's ascent, the orbital insertion burn that will raise the perigee, or low point of Starliner's orbit, out of the Earth's atmosphere. So stick with us. We're not done yet. Now 12 minutes and 30 seconds into today's flight. We just heard our Atlas console position report a spacecraft separation for 1450 after launch. Still about two minutes away. Now right now, ULA teams are confirming that Centaur is in a good configuration for separation, making sure that all of the pressures in the tanks are stable and it will be able to conduct a proper disposal burn later. Flight control teams here in the room are moving to their insertion checklists. Sixty seconds to spacecraft set. Centaur has now achieved its separation attitude. Just under a minute now to go into the launch vehicle separation. The team here on the ground reporting that Starliner and Centaur are both ready for it in the right orientation and on a stable trajectory. Thirty seconds to start on our separation. Centaur is holding attitude for Starliner separation. Ten seconds to separation. And we have confirmation of Starliner separation. And Starliner is flying alone on its way to orbit. Confirm LV separation. Confirm good LV separation. Thanks, ULA, for a smooth ride to space. And thank you, Dylan, for your help on that ascent commentary.
That milestone behind us. The next one we'll be watching for is that orbital insertion burn. That is going to raise the perigee or the low point of Starliner's orbit out of the Earth's atmosphere, putting it uh, in space for its full orbit. Uh, that's an important, important milestone to reach. It's going to be a 45 second burn. It'll change Starliner's velocity about 85 meters per second or 190 miles per hour. And that's going to be coming up at the 31 minute mark in today's orbit. We're now just under 16 minutes into today's flight, so still about 15 minutes to go for that. So there's a number of things that flight controllers are working on right now. They're transitioning Starliner from its launch mode over to its orbit mode. That includes powering up things like antennas, heaters, uh, and those radiators that I mentioned earlier. We have good targeting for orbital insertion, a good forward command link, and a good MET epoch timer. Starliner making its way over the North Atlantic. Some other things going on right now. They are powering down some what's called demonstration flight instrumentation. We have some extra sensors on there for these demonstration flights. Uh, we have more of them on during a power descent, but we don't need some of those right now, so flight controllers are powering some of those down. But some other things that are powering on include those propulsion line heaters. When uh, in the vacuum of space and in the Earth's shadow, it gets quite cold, around negative 250 degrees, so we want to make sure those propulsion lines don't freeze. And uh, the, the radiators are those little small silver disks you might be able to see on the side of the service module. Uh, if you remember your high school physics, the only way you can get rid of heat in a vacuum is through radiation. And so that sublimator will be powering down and the radiators will be taking care of the heat management for the rest of the flight until we get ready to come home. Some things that you also might be seeing on your screen are some RCS jet activations. Those are just helping a target for that orbital insertion burn. And at about L plus 23, the team will transition Starliner into what's called fine pointing mode uh, or thrust align mode. So those jets that you see firing will hold a very specific attitude, uh, which is exactly the attitude that we need for that orbital insertion burn, as Brandy mentioned earlier. We want that 85 meters per second of delta V to be going in exactly the right direction. And so the, the colors you're seeing on your screen, the... Oh, the right. The colors you're seeing on the screen are indicating Starliner's track right now. Starliner is currently coming up on the coast of Europe and is about 100, uh, 224 miles, excuse me, 139 miles, 224 kilometers above uh, the Atlantic Ocean as it makes its way to the uh, to the topmost or the highest part of this orbit. It will be um, heading uh, southeast over uh, Europe and, and a little bit of Africa in the next few minutes as it begins its uh, journey to start catching up with the International Space Station. Again, uh, one of the major milestones coming up in preparation for that is the orbital insertion burn coming up at uh, the 31-minute mark into today's flight. We're now just over 19 minutes in. Confirmation, we still have a good forward link command connection.
I'm getting a look at the number of teams who have been supporting today's launch all across the uh, all across the U.S., in particular here in uh, Houston, view here of the flight director, Mike Lammers, and uh, Rick Hempling, who's been assisting him, particularly with weather, with weather observations. And uh, earlier, you saw several of the teams who have been supporting from the launch site in Florida. Now, 21 minutes into today's flight, that's just about 10 minutes away from that orbital insertion burn that we're, that we're watching for. It's coming up at 31 minutes into the flight. So we're about a minute away before the flight controllers put Starliner into its thrust align mode. Once again, just making sure that Starliner is pointed exactly at the right attitude for that orbital insertion burn. It's going to hold that attitude. It is otherwise very quiet on the flight control loops, which, as Lauren said earlier, silence is golden. Guidance Navigation Control Officer confirmed that Starliner is moving towards that OI attitude and will begin holding for orbital insertion. With that, we're going to take a minute to pause and toss it back to Lauren in Florida, who I believe has a special guest there to talk with before uh, they wrap up their coverage for the day. Lauren? Hey, Brandy, thank you very much. Yes, joining me now is NASA astronaut Sonny Williams. Thank you so much for being here, Sonny. Thanks. It's and, great to be here today. And I know you've been following along. I've actually been able to see you from my perspective up here. I saw you in the moment of liftoff. You had your game face on. What was going through your mind at that moment? Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I, actually, leading up to this, I've been thinking about all the teams all over the, the country who are supporting this, you know, of course, here in Florida, but then back in uh, Houston and Denver. It's just a, a huge team to get this thing off the ground and to get uh, Starliner into flight. So at the moment of liftoff, I have to admit, though, I was thinking about what it's like to be sitting inside of there. So, uh, uh, you know, unabashed to, to just imagine what it will be like for the next launch when we have people riding in Starliner in and this Atlas V being a human-rated rocket is pretty awesome. Yeah, we heard the guys earlier saying they were jealous about Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, just a few months ago, we were talking about how much confidence you have in the Atlas V rocket. And what made you say that? Yeah, you know, we've been here a couple times watching launches, of course, uh, not only uh, for Starliner, for OFT the first time around, but also for other payloads that have gone up on the Atlas V. And, you know, they're pretty expensive. I told my mom at one point in time, if they're putting that expensive payload on top of that rocket, I feel pretty good about that. And, I, you know, I know I've, the team, I've been here, talked to all, a lot of people who have worked on this, you know, this rocket, both here, Decatur, for example, as well in Denver. And I, I understand the engineering, or at least I tried to understand the engineering that goes into this complex machine and you know they are a a plus you know people doing just such a great job so i know that their their hearts are with us and ready to launch humans into space 
Well, we are waiting for that orbital insertion burn. It is a very important milestone for Starliner. What are you watching for here? Yeah, we just want to make sure that, you know, that burn goes off without a flaw. We get uh, circularized around the planet, and then we can all take a, a deep breath and let the spacecraft fly for a little bit and get ready for the rendezvous profile for the ISS. So I think that is really uh, what we're waiting for, just to make sure it's going to happen correctly, which, you know, all indications are, are great. The, the spacecraft is working well. Now, Sunny, I see you at the office quite often. I see the guys at the office quite often. You guys really have um, worked closely with the people who have their hands on this spacecraft day in and day out. What does that relationship mean to you? It's huge. Like I mentioned, um, during the days leading up to this, I really was just thinking about the teams. All of the hard work that they've gone, you know, into getting the spacecraft ready to go, as well as getting this rocket ready to go. I know ULA has done a lot of work uh, leading up to this after the last attempt, and it's this relationship is so key. Um, I feel like I just want to stay committed to them to make sure that we 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 get to the finish line with getting people to the International Space Station. And so, as soon as you guys finish up here tonight. Then what happens? Where are you going next? Oh, heading back to Houston. You know, Mission Control in Houston right now has has the spacecraft, and uh, we want to watch the rendezvous profile. You know, we're also all three of us are sort of sitting in the shoes of or in the seat of Rosie. You know, wondering what it's going to be like and what the spacecraft is going to see, how it's going to act, and all of that rendezvous profile. So we'll be right there following along. So it's going to be an exciting 24 hours. We're, we're, I'm racing back. I'll be home tonight to be able to be in Mission Control uh, in some capacity watching just like here, uh, watching that rendezvous profile. And can you tell us much about what would happen between uh, now and crewed flight? What kind of training do you have to go through and, how, and what kind of things are we going to be working on with Starliner? Right. So we, this mission is going to prove, you know, we're going to learn stuff. Not everything is going to go 100% correct, right? right? We learn stuff every time we take something to space. And so we're going to take those lessons learned from this mission and apply it to the next launch, which is the crewed flight test. Um, but even beside for that, we have testing that we're ready to go do. We have the crew validation test, which is coming up this summer, where the three of us will be in the spacecraft, you know, in the suits, in the seats, checking out the environmental control system, checking out the ergonomics, making sure we fit, we're ready to go. Um, we also be looking, working with the software folks, so looking at all the displays, making sure that all the displays um, tell us the, the right information and we understand it correctly and we can work with mission control with that. So there's a lot. And then, as cor of course, there's training with, with the control team. The control team, we've had some training with them, but you know, leading up to this, they've been working on an un crude version. And now, you know, us little pains in the neck are going to be sitting in there talking back to them. So we're going to work through all that chore choreography of how we're going to work together th in the spacecraft. Well, Sunny, your time is valuable. I really appreciate you joining us here. I know you need to get back down to the console and uh, follow along. So thank you for being here. And we are going to continue to follow along the loops here at the ASOC and wait for that orbital insertion burn, which is basically when Starliner will be up in orbit, hanging out until we're ready to start the rendezvous process and docking tomorrow. So for now, that's it for me and Sunny and as well as Dylan Rice here in Florida. And we'll get you back over to Brandy and Josh in Houston. Thanks so much, Lauren. And great to hear from Sunny. We're now just about two minutes away from the orbital insertion burn. That again is going to be a 45 uh, second burn. It's going to raise the perigee of, or the low point of uh, Starliner's orbit out of the Earth's atmosphere and get, get it into a stable orbit. And after that, we'll begin checking out the, uh, the uh, critical control uh, systems before tomorrow's docking. minute and a half until the orbital insertion burn. Starliner is in the burn attitude. You might have seen earlier the nose of Starliner, Starliner might have been pointed down towards the Earth, but that's actually the attitude that it needs to be because as it orbits around the Earth, um, it will no longer be pointing at Earth. It will be pointing at that specific point in space that um, the orbital insertion burn will send us to. And once again, there will be a lot of thruster activity. Uh, we want those four aft-facing OMAC engines, that's about 1,200 pounds of thrust each, uh, to be pushing in exactly the right direction. OMAC standing for Orbital Maneuvering and Attitude Control. They're going to fire for 45 seconds for this burn. 
changing Starliner's velocity by 85 meters per second or 190 miles per hour. 30 seconds to go now until that burn ignites. Orbital insertion burn starting in five, four, three, two, one. Again, this burn is going to last for 45 seconds. Teams here on the ground reporting four good orbital maneuvering and attitude control thrusters. Now the colors you're seeing on those jets, or you were seeing on those jets, uh, they indicate which integrated propulsion controller uh, those jets are mapped to. We have three IPCs, integrated propulsion controllers. OI cutoff in five, four, three, two, one. And we have OI cutoff. And and we have confirmation from Flight Director Mike Lammers. We have a good orbital insertion burn. Starliner is in a stable circular orbit on its way to the International Space Station. Now, this was a a big hurdle to get through early on. We have a few demos to go on our, on our way to the ISS, and then after that, hopefully a very good docking. But so far today, good launch, great performance from ULA. Atlas even gave us a little bit more of a push than we needed, but Centaur was able to adjust accordingly, place Starliner exactly where we needed it, and we have confirmation of a good OI burn. Once again, Starliner is in orbit, heading to the ISS. It's a major milestone to get behind us, but it is really just the beginning. We've got a number of demonstrations now that Starliner will have to go through ahead of its International Space Station arrival. Those are gonna start pretty much right away with a checkout of the uh, VESTA systems. VESTA stands for Vision-Based Electro-Optical Sensory Tracking Assembly. They're basically sensors that take measurements that Starliner uses for relative navigation. Starliner has two of them, and each contains four sensors, a camera with a narrow view, a camera with a wide view, an infrared camera, and a LADAR unit that uses LADAR to, de to detect range. Just a couple more things they're working through on their orbital insertion checklist. We have confirmation good radiator activation. So those radiators are now in control and controlling the thermal environment inside the cabin. And going back a little bit, just to help you guys learn a little bit about Starliner, going back to those IPCs, that blue, green, and red is what propulsion controller each of those thrusters are mapped to. So if you think of the flight controllers like the brain of Starliner, the IPCs are kind of like the nervous system, translating kind of those commands into movement. So we'll see the team continue to exercise those throughout the flight. Next up are a couple demos, but I think for now, we'll wrap up here in Houston. 
That's right. With that last milestone safely behind us, we're going to say goodbye for the night. Uh, the Starliner team here in Mission Control will be monitoring continually as Starliner makes its way towards the International Space Station. Right now, Starliner is about 118 miles above the coast of Africa, heading towards the Indian Ocean. And uh, with that, since the next uh, the next uh, destination for Starliner is going to be the International Space Station, we're going to get an update from Gary Jordan down the hall in the International Space Station flight control room. But that is it for Josh and I for the night. That was a great launch, and we are excited to see Starliner on its way. Gary? Hey, thanks, Brandy and Josh. It is so great to see Starliner in a good orbit and heading for the International Space Station. Teams here in the Space Station Flight Control Room will be monitoring Starliner's approach over the next 24 hours to dock with the orbiting lab. In that time, it will perform activation and checkouts of various systems, a few early demonstrations of its thrusters, guidance, navigation, and control equipment, as well as its communication systems as it executes a series of burns to gradually raise its altitude and get closer to the station. Tomorrow, be sure to tune in for our coverage of the approach and docking phase. When we get inside the approach ellipsoid or about a two-kilometer marker from the station, we'll see a few critical demonstrations of the Starliner to verify some of the spacecraft's capabilities to keep astronauts safe. We'll see station astronauts command a hold of the Starliner, and we'll see the Starliner perform a retreat maneuver in the approach corridor. After today's successful launch, we're targeting to start our coverage of Starliner's approach to the station at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow for a docking scheduled for 7.10 p.m. The International Space Station crew is expected to host a welcome ceremony of the spacecraft to the station the following day, and we may get some peeks inside the Starliner. It'll be a busy week here in Houston during that docked phase of Starliner, and that's lo there's a lot to do. In the meantime, that'll do it for us here in Mission Control Houston. With that, I'll send it back to Daryl and Dee over at the Kennedy Space Center. Thanks, Gary. I'd like to thank the launch and flight teams across the country for making this day possible. But as you've heard many times, we know this is the first of many critical milestones for this test flight. Once docked, the Starliner will undergo a number of checkouts, including battery charging, transferring files through the space station downlink, hatch open and close, and cargo transfer. And of course, all of these demonstrations will provide the data needed to bring Boeing closer to having the privilege of carrying astronauts to and from the space station. And NASA astronauts are certainly looking forward to that. The docking that you mentioned scheduled for a little bit less than 24 hours from now at 7.10 p.m. Eastern time. And while we're, talking, while we're talking schedules, make sure you stay tuned for a post-launch news conference at 9 p.m. Eastern time on our website, nasa.gov forward slash live. And uh, NASA, Boeing, and ULA leadership will be on hand to answer questions about the OFT2 test flight up until this point in time. Until then, and then afterwards, you can find updates at nasa.gov forward slash commercial crew, all one word. And then, of course, you can follow us on Twitter, as you can see there on the right-hand side, at commercial underscore crew. We leave you now with another look at the launch of orbital flight test number two. But before we do that, I got to compliment that jacket. No. Oh. That's, that's a nice jacket. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's looking good. Keep your eye on it. Yes. Somebody might burgle it from you <laughs> if you're not looking. For D. Russell, Boeing, ULA, and all of us here at the NASA Kennedy and Johnson Space Centers, I'm Daryl Nail. Have a good night, and remember to keep looking up. Two minutes. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Bot sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LH2. 